Tuesday morning is always a hard one. <laughs> so for welcome to the last five hours for DLD. Hubert, as I see you looking at me, uh, as you know, um, women's lib and uh, gender equality has a huge tradition in the Berda family because you told me that you asked your mother once, Mom, Anna Borda, a famous Anna Borda, Mom, what do you think about gender equality in women's lib? Gender equality? I always took what I wanted. And now please remain standing only those women who have children. Oh, that's really, yeah, that's serious. That's not a lot. I often end up on women's panels, but it's odd for me because I don't reflect on my experience at Google as what does it feel like to be a woman at Google. I think of myself much more as a geek <laughs> and say, well, what does it feel like to be a geek at Google? And I have to tell you, like, there's no better place for geeks. <laughs> but it's impossible to change the world, just women, but together, it's very, very good. When men are working together, <laughs> they have to show who is the best. But where you are looking for a solution, women are more oriented towards solutions. I think the next step will be that um, it's absolutely no of no importance if, um, if a politician, a female politician, has children or not. Because for none of the men, this is an issue. I see the transition of little girls. Uh, they play just like boys play, uh, with cars, with everything. And at some point, the message that they get through the media or the families is, uh, you know, to to be more accepted, there are certain female qualities, maybe it's, uh, lose, it, that make them lose some confidence. This is one of the, the issues that cloud computing is really straining from a policy standpoint, because is it where the data is stored? Is it where the data is served? Right. So if you're a citizen of the US, but you're here in Germany, right. you're accessing your data in the US, should it be subject to German law or not? Right now, it's basically where the, based on where the data lives. There's a question about where's the authoritative source. Right. Where's the, the copy that's the golden copy, the one that you depend upon? The great thing about cloud computing is I, you can very safely say everybody in this room uses cloud computing services all the time, every day, anytime you do anything. I mean, it's, it's practically impossible to be, I mean, you can't be on the internet today without, I mean, that, it's, it's a curious thing. And obviously there are some things like web-based email that are, I would say, you know, cloudier than something just like search so we take, say, textbook publisher's content, uh, any educational publisher content, they use us as a platform, and then all that content is enriched by our technology so that it's, it's adapted to the individual student. Every single day, a new syllabus is created for that student dynamically. We are basically creating a global chalkboard, a place where students from around the world gather together, embrace peer-to-peer -peer teaching, make the best use of um, diverse backgrounds. If I had to pick one, it'd be access. There's one and a quarter billion school-aged kids in the world, um, and about one billion of them don't have basic reading or writing or math skills. So they can't compose a simple letter, they can't do basic arithmetic. That's one billion kids. And that is a gateway issue to every other problem the world faces. I don't think we should try and substitute real human to human interaction, which is what schools are, by um, an, an, an anonymous online tool. Maybe if I had to pick a site, it'd be Google, oddly enough, because how somebody learns, how a young person learns by a search or a query um, is, I think, really different than how I learned, and, and that, I think, is really exciting. We keep talking about a small percentage of the population, and there is a huge percentage, either that the parents, as he mentioned, don't care, or there aren't any other option for them. And we should use what we have to make a difference in the world, and the way to make a difference in the education world is technology. It might not be the best way, it's the only way that exists right now to close gaps, and that's what we should do. Well, visibly, Wall Street has another problem that typically when you lose a lot of money, it's not yours. And as we see now, we have backward capitalism, where it's capitalism for the profits of Wall Streeters, but it's socialism for the losses. You come with two kidneys, two lungs, two, so you have spare parts. The, the, the economic life does not have spare parts. It's too costly for a bank to have spare money on the side. You see? 
That is, that is what, so the system, the economic system was based, was becoming more and more fragile because capitalism makes you more and more fragile, just like Iceland, till things blow up and break. For a firm in principle, there is a long horizon. People have a much shorter time scale. They have to have three meals a day, a salary every month, a bonus every year if they are in the financial industry. And so their scale of rewards is on a completely different scale than what is in principle the best interest of the corporation. I want to change the world to make it resistant to forecast errors. We wanted to make sure that we could offer Facebook in every language. And it's a really language intensive site because you have these products like Newsfeed that are literally going through um, all of the, the information that people are sharing, figuring out what are going to be the most interesting things to show you, and then writing little, little um, stories about them. Really language intensive, you know, hundreds of thousands of phrases. So, what we did was we built this way that people in, in their own language can translate. Facebook or little bits of it into whatever language that they want. So we've already made it available in, I think it's more than 20 languages, um, already more than 60 or so are in translation. How are you doing in comparison to Studio Outset, since that's a comparison that makes some sense? You, you must think it's a comparison that makes sense or you wouldn't be suing them for copying you, I suppose. <laughs> well, I mean, our stance on that has always just been that you know, in, in order to, to succeed right, and be the platform that people are using to share information, you just have to be the most effective. I mean, I think it's working so far. So we're already up from 1.2 million users in October to over 2 million users now just a few months later. So, and that's a new fact that hasn't been announced before, right? Yeah, that's, that's new public information. Now that you have Facebook Connect, it's a fundamentally new environment. This is the ability to, on any website, build the, uh, a button, basically, that allows you to bring whatever activity you have on that website into Facebook through the news feeds of your friends. Facebook Connect is going to be increasingly important. We already have hundreds of thousands of developers on Facebook platform. We're getting started with Connect. Um, we, we just announced a while ago that we had our thousandth developer with Facebook Connect. That's going to be a really big focus for us in 2009. But philosophically, where we are is we want to make it so that everyone can share the same amount of information, the same types of information, um, has access to the same distribution channels, these public streams, private streams, can make the same kind of connections. Many people talk about Facebook as disappointing from a revenue point of view. Where is the revenue going at the moment? The primary focus for us is on user growth and spreading Facebook. The revenue side of things is also growing extremely well. right? So we have these two primary revenue lines. There's the direct sales channel that's focused mostly on, on, um, on brand advertising. Right? So we started off in the US. We work with more than 2 thirds of, of the top advertisers. And what's happened is, as we've grown internationally, we've opened up offices um, in all the different countries where we've grown very quickly. Obama, as everyone knows, some people have called it the Facebook campaign. He used Facebook and social networking very aggressively, and it was quite effective. He used a lot of different sites, and the one where he had the most connections by far was Facebook. Right. So now, after the inauguration, I think he's up to beyond 4 million connections or something like that. So it's just a, a staggering amount. And what that gives him is the ability to communicate directly with people by putting information in their public streams, their, their private uh, messages and streams, and things like that, and just continue to reach people over time.